thank you for the, to the organizers um, for inviting me to talk. I was tasked with the hypermobile spine. And um, as Clara just mentioned about different syndromes that have hypermobility associated with it, there can be a number of different spinal problems. So I did kind of cone it down to the connective tissue disorders, um, more similar to what Dr. Frankomana was mentioning. <clears throat> the hypermobile spine that we see, um, sometimes my patients come in and do tricks like this to um, show things off. Um, they do a lot of different things to show off their hypermobility. But one thing that we've, it's in the neurosurgical literature, is a lot of information about sort of instability due to ligamentous laxity. And some of these are well known to you as far as Down syndrome, pseudochondroplasia, SED, Morchio. And then you get into stuff, those tend to have a little bit more of other things associated with it besides just pure ligamentous laxity. Then you get into Kines, Larson, Marfan, Lowy's Deeds, and, ED, and EDS, where there has been some documented um, instability that has been reported on, and sometimes with trauma, sometimes without, to suggest that their underlying connective tissue disorder is largely responsible for their um, issues. And this shouldn't be much of a surprise. These are, again, some of the potential patients. Mr. Phelps is not one of my patients, but I think he should be. Um, you can see how much his elbows hyperextend there. And so there are a number of different- He's score of seven as his position. I counted one day and I got at least five and I didn't get everything, of course, but um, I was sure he was uh, up there. So, you know, there's a number, like I said, a number of different tricks, but the bendability, and obviously, if other joints are affected, why not the spine? The spine is a series of joints after all. So most of the time, it was um, something I think a lot of times as a geneticist, we paid less attention to because the Biden score drove us to looking at the major weight-bearing joints, the knees, the hips, the ankles, the digits, et cetera, and less so at the spine. But the spine or the neck um, included in that is a major source of their issues. They have pain, hyperlordosis, postural kyphosis, just poor mechanics. And sometimes that's obviously kind of the current generation of our poor mechanics and everything being smaller and electronic in front of us and we're typing away so the kids really do have a lot of poor mechanics, so it's always hard to tease out are they, is it because of the laxity or whatever else, but some sort of just hang on those ligaments. Um, they may have scoliosis or kyphoscoliosis. I was surprised when I talked to one of the surgeons because I would always try to engage them about spine issues related to EDS and I wouldn't get a lot of interest. And uh, we would have these conversations with Dr. Crawford. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Dr. Crawford. Um, and I was part of a multi spine team. And we would talk about these um, patients and I'd bring a few here and there. And, and it was interesting to, you know, EDS and spine and scoliosis, we know it. And it's like, really? It's not in the literature um, a lot to actually do that to to pull that out. And so I think it's always been sort of this experience and not necessarily stuff that's been in the peer-reviewed literature. Outside of that, we see some spondylosis, spondylosthesis, early degenerative changes, both more of an osteoarthritic as well as the disc. With that, you can get the, obviously, the radicopathy at the tetachord and Chiari. I was let others who are here to speak to those um, obviously, you've already heard some on the craniosacral junction instability, and we'll hear more, and the cervical medullary problems. We see a lot of TMJ or TMD problems as well that sort of impact on the neck and, and or vice versa. Um, it has been amazing to me, and one of the things that I actually take back as a reward is that connective tissue involves a lot of different organ systems. So I had the pleasure of interacting with my orthopedists, my neurosurgeons, dentists, 
psychiatrists, psychologists, people who specialize in autonomic disorders. And so I get a number of dentists who will tell me that there's something wrong with their neck, which is what's screwing up their, spine, their, their jaw, and they want me to fix their neck before they can do anything with their jaw. And I put pain there just to be redundant, because pain is a, um, a large complaint of them. This is sort of a pain diagram, a bit crude. Um, this has been published. Uh, Vormans have put this out a long time ago of where people sort of indicated pain. Um, I would actually say that the upper back pain is, should be more dark uh, than the majority of my patients, but that again is probably more of an ascertainment bias. But most of the time, that, like I said, what we're thinking of is more of the weight-bearing joints, the knees, hips, ankles, um, and any kind of functional shoulder, uh, elbows, and wrist. It's also interesting to take a look at this and look at it from just joint hypermobility or generalized joint hypermobility and take away the syndrome part. Um, because there, this gets mentioned. And obviously if you, if you talk about spinal hypermobility, you get a lot of literature about um, trauma, you get a lot of literature um, about spondylosis, spondylosis, uh, other things that's sort of associated with more an acute problem. The generalized problems are not very well described, but you can find it in the occupational literature, um, you can find it in chiropractic literature, manual therapy, et cetera. <clears throat> so there are um, some studies that are coming out that talk about just increased um, lumbar motion, um, which again, it's a series of joints. So just like our other joints that we merit, measure that have high mobility, why not the spine? It doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem, but at least we get down to the mechanics and say there's something different about that spine. A terminology from the 1970 was the loose back spine. Um, loose back syndrome, where it was mostly people who had lower back mechanical pain and who had generalized joint type mobility. They found the association. They didn't necessarily find the association with the syndromic management, but they knew that they were at higher risk. And some of that has to do with also lower body mechanics, because obviously if you're standing sort of like the swimmer with the knees back or whatever else, and you have the poor mechanics starting from the feet up, you're gonna put a lot of stress on the lower back. Trauma and ligaments laxity, like I said, there's a lot of sort of information that's there, but is there information to glean out for a connective tissue disorder? They talk about ligamentous strain versus ligamentous stretch, and strain is just that. It's an injury. A lot of people recover from it. You have to remember in a lot of connective tissue disorders that healing process is actually often abnormal, and they may not heal from it. And so what was a strain that should have been repaired may continue to lead to chronic insufficiency. And so there are a number of people who have made that observation. The stretch is as well. Um, it's considered somewhat of an inelastic material, and therefore if you exceed a certain stretch, do you have damage to that tissue, and therefore you have the stretch. Now a lot of this obviously comes out of some of the whiplash injury type models, but most of my patients that I refer to the neurosurgeon, and it's usually just the majority, actually, um, usually had some type of trauma to their neck. We had a motor vehicle accident, uh, some very interesting stories of surfboards and other things um, where they've had injury, they were, had the usual you know, three, six months of dealing with it, got better, and then a few years later started having more necrotic, insidious um, pain. So does ligaments laxity have a role in that? And I'll tell you in the um, civil courts, it's getting to be recognized that this is something that predisposes to um, injury and we know that insufficient ligaments and other joints don't protect you as well. So can a minor trauma cause more major problems? And <clears throat> that is one of the things that we see. I don't think it's a bit of a stretch. This was something from the chiropractic college. Um, they looked at the hypermobile spine and they said they sort of saw three different categories. People who had just repetitive stress loading. Um, that could be anybody who 
um, lifted or did anything like that. Uh, the whiplash type injury or just a smoldering insidious mm -hmm. onset. Even with all of those, it seemed to be a slowly progressive disease. Patients would complain of obviously the pain, but the clicking and the grinding. Um, a lot of times they would have radiation. They would have that ice pick headache, or at least just the upper cervical spine headache. It may localize there, but a lot of them it came forward. It may be bilateral, it may be ipsilateral. With that obviously was a lot of muscle tension and pain and then you get into what I call the golden triangle, the, the shoulders, the upper back, and all that sort of uh, getting involved and having pain and spasms. The Australian manual, manual therapist felt the same thing. There's a lot of the patients that qualify under minor cervical instability where they complain of neck pain, the catching, the locking, uh, locking. They have weakness of core muscular control. They usually have an altered range of motion. It can be hypermobile. It could be hypermobile as well. Obviously, it depends on how much muscle strain. Many of them presented with a remote history of major trauma. And on their examination, they were sort of feeling an unusual sort of give um, at the end, which told them that there was more of a limitous insufficiency. And there's the, um, a few tests that the therapists um, do. Scoliosis, as I mentioned, some people just call it spinal instability. I have seen these correct fairly, I've seen a 30 degree curve correct very easily with physical therapy and a little bit of bracing. So it's, it's a nice flexible spine. So if you have an asymmetric muscle spasm, the paraspinal muscles or whatever else, I've seen it correct by just trying to address sort of that issue. Um, not correct down to zero, but correct substantially. So it's one of those things that the surgeons, uh, the spine surgeons usually told me they sort of like this because even if it was a severe, se severe curve, they could reduce it quite a bit uh, when they do surgical fixation. Osteoarthritis has been um, mentioned and observed in the past. Dr. Graham, who you'll hear next, uh, was one of those original observers and we do sort of see this, but a lot of it is anecdotal evidence the same thing with degenerative disc disease. I see a lot of it in 20 and 30 year olds in the lumbar area, which I'm told is not too much surprised, but I see a lot of cervical stuff too. And they've not necessarily had trauma or anything else. So something is causing some undue stress. And then obviously you'll continue to hear more about the allantoaxial instability here. Um, it can be associated with ligamentous laxity in general. Um, that's usually a generalized statement, but most of the time they're picking out those particular disorders that we sort of mentioned um, up front. But if it's still ligamentous laxity, we still have a large percent of the population who have some degree of ligamentous laxity. And are we talking about not a small pool of potential people, but a larger ones? And one specifically in EDS, there are individual case reports um, and you can um, see the ones reported from TCI as well. Headache overall is very common in this and it's multiple different types. Um, but one of the things I found interesting in the literature, um, one I didn't include here was from rheumatoid arthritis, um, who those patients uh, were found to have serious types of headaches, they actually described it to the neck, but it didn't quite meet cervical genic headache criteria, um, but those were hypermobile patients, and Dr. Rosen here um, did 12 patients, 10 of which had generalized joint type of mobility, and he said they had this new daily persistent headache, and all he could find was this cervical neck hypermobility. Um, he actually didn't even recognize their generalized hypermobility until I told him to check for it. He went back and said, oh yeah, instead of 11 out of 12 with cervical hypermobility, I have 10 out of 12 who have generalized. So it's, that was a quick brief overview for the 15 minutes that I had a little bit here. The literature has a lot of small case series and, and et cetera about a number of different spine things. I don't think it's too much of a leap of faith to understand the spine should be involved in something that has generalized ligamentous laxity. 
I think the challenge for all of us is to how best to describe and characterize um, this, um, both in incidents, in the management, and what criteria we would use for any kind of surgical intervention. Thank you. Thank you, that was an excellent overview. Are there questions for that? If not, thank you. Uh, yes, raise your hand. Uh, what's the, uh, what do you think the incidence of craniocervical problems is in the EDS population? Um, the incidence. So, of the EDS patients, I was over a little more than a two and a half year time. There was 700 and 750-ish, I think 738 was the actual number. We had referred 83 for neurosurgical evaluation, half of which ended up with surgery. Probably half of the ones that didn't, I felt like still had, they just didn't want to do the surgery. So that's you know, 60, 70. So I do feel like it's a substantial number, but we did go back and, like I said, a lot of them have remote history. So how much, you know, was it ligamus laxity or was it unrecognized other kinds of problems? 